Inspector Jowett, sir. Ah, Quip. Constable Thackeray. Your first visit to the Academy, I dare say. Quite correct, sir. I'll get to see the portraits of the convict office, though. Yes. Well, the reason I arranged you to come was, um, was this picture here. Expecting someone to steal it, sir? Oh, no, the stealing's already been done. I want you to recover it. You've lost me now, sir. Uh, not this painting, of course. Now, I should explain. Now, this is an Etty, and he painted two versions, nearly identical. And the only difference is that the other one... The one that was stolen. Exactly. That was different in that, um, that piece of material there over the thigh... Sir? Now, that piece of material was absent. I see, sir. And the stolen painting belonged to a friend of mine, a man of cultivated taste, a member of the Royal Society, Dr. Probert. Oh, Dr. Probert and Dr. Probert speck me up. Well, certainly not. Dr. Probert of the University of London, a very distinguished physiologist, and I was with him socially only yesterday evening, and he asked me personally to ensure the recovery of his painting. And that's the reason why I've asked you in, and, uh, not the local constabulary. Anything else taken apart from the painting, sir? That is one of the strange features. Dr. Probert had a number of other more valuable paintings, all of classical subjects. Alma, Tadima, Leighton. Mostly young ladies in a state of nature. Yeah. That is neither here nor there. Dr. Probert went to Charterhouse. He has a schooling in the classics. Any other information to go on, sir? Only a rather strange coincidence. The picture was stolen last Friday evening. Dr. Probert was giving a lantern lecture at University College Hospital. And um, his wife and his daughter were in the audience. But previous Saturday, the Probert's had given a dinner party, and one of their guests, a Miss Crush, returned to find that her home had been burnt. Could be a coincidence, could be connected. What was stolen, sir? <laughs> you think I'm going to say a picture, don't you? Not necessarily, sir. In fact, it was a royal Worcester vase in the Japanese style. Valuable, sir? Worth about 30 pounds. Nothing else taken? No. But on the same sideboard, there was a Minton vase by Solon, valued over the 1,000 guineas. This Miss Crush, sir. Obviously a rich woman. Is she a close friend of Dr. Probert's? They only met three weeks ago. Do they share a common interest? What's that, sir? They're both spiritualists. A matter on which a scientific mind like his has all too rarely been directed. Who is that? Detective Sergeant Griff, Great Scotland Yard. You may enter, policeman. In case your deductive powers are not equal to the task, I should tell you my name's Probert. Well, sit yourself down. I'm not too proud to share my seat with the public servant, but I'm damned if I want him staring me in the face. Well, what's your first impression? Mostly of a great many sets of velvet curtains, sir. Get up and pull the drawstring of one of them. Doesn't matter which. Close the curtain again, please. I can't be too discreet when there are ladies in the house. My wife and daughter understand that they're forbidden to set foot in this room, but women are a perverse sex. I won't beat about the bush with you, policeman. My wife's incapable of understanding me. Sir? Oh, it's my own fault. I married her for her father's money. She gave me that and a handsome daughter and 21 years of boredom. So to keep my sanity, I found distractions <laughs> in art. I'd like to see where the stolen picture was hanging, if I may, sir. The Eddie's second pair of curtains on the right. My right or yours, sir? You're right, policeman. The scoundrel removed the picture from the frame. Just hope he didn't damage the surface, the, the texture of that young woman's skin. He cut it from the frame. Rough work for an art thief. He'll have a job disposing of it. Was it anything to do with the subject of the painting, do you think? I believe there are men who look at pictures like mine for the wrong reason. Whatever the reason, sir, he knew a lot about the workings of your household. Really? Yeah. Knew you were out, where to break in, and how to locate this picture gallery. Well, that's my collection to every Tom, Dick and Harry, you know. Inspector Jowett mentioned you having guests to a seance. A scientific experiment, yes. Saturday before last. You like the names of me, sir? Certainly not. Not having my friends subjected to an inquisition blasted, I'd rather forget the whole thing. One was a Miss Crush, 
I shall be seeing her this afternoon. I expect she'll give me the names, but I do dislike having to press a lady for information. You mean you propose... I find putting the screws on a lady almost as distasteful as bribing domestics, sir. Bribing? Joe, I'd promise to send me somebody to speak to... Just tell me who was at the seance, sir. There'll be no need. Very well, policeman, but don't you push me too far. Well, there were five people here that evening, apart from myself. My daughter Alice, two friends, this crush. And your wife, sir? Uh, Winifred, she's terrified of the supernatural. Spent the evening locked in the bathroom with back numbers of the Tatler. Said that's where a ghost was least likely to manifest itself. Not like my daughter Alice. Now, she's inherited her brains from my side of the family. She'd make a first-rate scientist if she was a man. She has some other occupation then, sir? Oh, God, no, she's not in employment, if that's what you mean. She does charity work around the parish. Well, if you're finished in here, we'll retire to the drawing room. I want to smoke a cigar. My latest acquisition. The Rape of the Sabine Women. It's magnificent. Want to see it? Not just now, sir. We policemen come across quite enough of that sort of thing. Any more questions, policemen, before I have you shown up? Just the names of the other guests, sir. Oh, if you insist. Captain William Nye, Alice's fiancé. Bought himself a commission in these Surreys. You said there were five people present, sir. Strathmore, a fellow scientist. Highly respected figure in the world of psychical investigation. One of the lads. The fast set, sir? L-A-D-S, the Life After Death Society. I see, sir. And that's all. Brand. Peter Brand, the medium. Mrs. Probert? Yes? I do apologize, ma'am. I quite failed to notice you. People frequently do. There's no need to apologize. My husband hasn't noticed me for years. Then there was Peter Brand, the medium. Pretty you haven't met Alice. She's out on a charitable excursion, I dare say. Meeting people. You see young Alice striding down the hill in search of a destitute family with a marrow under her arm. It's a stirring sight, I promise you. Must be taxing. I'd have thought it'd be quite a problem finding a family of that sort here in Richmond. Quite right, but she's inexhaustible. Are you reached any conclusion yet? Just an assumption, sir. At present, I'm assuming a connection between the thefts of a painting and a vase and the fact that both burglaries occurred shortly after seances. Yours and Miss Crush's. You are a sensitive. No, ma'am. A detective sergeant from Scotland Yard. Oh, a sensitive sergeant. Do sit down. <laughs> I'm inquiring into the theft of your vase, ma'am. Oh, don't bother about it. It wasn't one of my better ones. I have all the details about how entry was affected and so on. The servants didn't hear anything, apparently. My maid noticed a broken window when she was locking up. Ah, oh, yes, indeed. Oh, but I was in such a state of perturbation. It had been such an exciting seance. Not just table tapping, but voices. Quite distinct. Remarkable. Uh, the vase, ma'am. Was it on display when you had the seance here the week before? Yes, but it wasn't noticeable. And you had similar psychical phenomena then, table tapping and so on? A hand materialised. And the table moved. We all felt it move. Well, it looks a fairly solid piece of furniture. God help us, ma'am. There's a man under here. I know. You may come out now, Mr. Strathmore. I thought of telling you when you first came in, but I thought you might have put the wrong construction on it. <laughs> I was checking, Sergeant. Sir? Checking. Loose floorboards, hidden springs, hollow legs. As Honorary Secretary of the Life After Death Society, I have devoted 12 years to investigating mediums and testing them scientifically. And in 12 years, I have yet to find a medium who is not a fraud or a charlatan. Sir? Because only by eliminating the fraudulent can we find someone who genuinely has the power and through him or her conclusively establish the existence of the hereafter. Uh, Mr. Brand, sir? All I can say is that so far, I have found no evidence of trickery. And that, I should add, is in itself remarkable. He may be another Daniel Hume! Do you mind my asking, ma'am, how much did you pay Brand for his services as a medium? His fee is ten guineas, but I gave him a little extra. It was such a productive seance. I'm very much looking forward to questioning him. You're going to meet him, but you mustn't. Don't worry, ma'am, he doesn't frighten me. No, but you might frighten him. He's such a delicate young man. I'll handle him gentle, I promise you. I'm afraid I'm going to insist that you forget about my vase. Drop the investigation, you mean? Call off the hound, so to speak. Can't do that, sir. This is a criminal matter. Surely not going to... Interrogate him? No, ma'am. Just arrange to um, bump into him, as it were. I beg leave to introduce a young medium whose seances in the past few weeks have been so exceptional 
that he is rapidly becoming the talk of the metropolis. What do you say to the writing of a message from the late Duke of Wellington in a private house in Camberwell? Writing, I may say, which has been verified as authentic by the foremost graphologist in London. And broken window of Miss Crush's broken with a brick. From the other side yeah, there was a window with the broken sash cord not ten yards away. Uncommon crude. Unprofessional. I say unseen, for that is how they see Did you get the details from Richmond? But I have seen the fella made quite a business of it getting into the Probert's house. He knocked over a tin of bath olives in the pantry. He scattered a packet of pearl barley all over the floor. It was on a shelf over his head. <laughs> he was a pretty poor hand as a burglar. Inspector Jowett. What? But I heard him as clearly as March on, children, he cried. You do not need Mr. Bear Brown hasn't spoken yet. Truth is more powerful. No, he's not that Professor Quail now. Until young Brand appeared. It was the most sought after medium in London. Decent of him to include the boy in his lecture. Well, I see that uh, both Dr. Probert and Miss Crush are here. Sir. No doubt she was gratified to learn that great Scotland Yard is on the track of her bars. Wasn't the impression I got, sir. She says she doesn't mind about the bars. Rather, we dropped the investigation. I told her we couldn't. I trust you didn't threaten the lady. Dr. Probert repeated me mere remark that you were threatening to put the screws on Miss Crush. She's a person of refinement, you know. Slip of the tongue, sir. Nothing more. I can vouch for that, sir. Oh, good God, I hope you weren't there. But to return to the young medium who is with us here tonight, this young man only employs his powers out of humility and respect for those who have gone on the great journey, but care to offer comfort. There are, passing among you, helpers with envelopes. If you would care to place some small personal article inside one of them, signing your name on the outside, the medium will attempt to establish contact with any spirit who wishes to manifest itself here amongst us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Mr. Peter Brand. Miss Crush, she's handed in an envelope. And all be people he knows. Needn't be. What you got in your pocket? Only my derbies. They'll do. Eh? Hey? This is from a Miss Crush. A Miss Crush? You have a residence in Belgravia? Yes. I told you so. Because I feel an old person, a male, an uncle. The name begins with a W. Walter. Yes. Yes, Uncle Walter. I took you to the great exhibition at the Crystal Palace many years ago. Yes. The great exhibition where I am now is even more magnificent. Did that make any sense to you? Oh, yes. Yes. Thank you. The next envelope is from a Mr. Thackeray. Uh, could uh, Mr. Thackeray show himself? On your feet. Oh. 
If this is some kind of practical joke, I find it in arrant bad taste. It was the only thing I got in my pocket. You are a police officer? That's right, sir. A police officer in plain clothes? Right again, sir. I'm afraid this is not a personal article. The ones above would not consider handcuffs as personal. Well, there's some in the other places, might, sir. I uh, think it's time we moved on to other matters. If the attendants would kindly turn down the gas. The first photographic plate I'm going to show you is of the medium, Miss Georgina Houghton. Now, observe this plate Off taken me. a few minutes later. Stop it, like this. <laughs> but no. Violence. Sorry to detain you, sir, but I'm sure you wouldn't want to go out without your coat and hat. Perishing cold night. Forgotten them, have you? Oh, Upset oh. by Thackeray's Darby's, I expect. Shabby trick to play on a sensitive man. Positively stopped you in the middle of your act, didn't he? It ain't an act. My mistake, sir. Unfortunate word. Look, I didn't want all that. I didn't want all that, you know. Quail put me up with it. Says I've got to get me name before the public. Professor Quail. Friend of yours? Well, he took me in, didn't he? Got a room in his house. He's the one who taught me how to get in touch. It's a gift, but you've got to learn how to handle it. What made him take you in, do you think? Well, he's almost lost the power, hasn't he? He wanted to find someone he could pass his knowledge on to. And his engagement book? Now, I found a few of my own clients, you know. Including Miss Crash. Must have been quite impressive to the audience, all that stuff about Uncle Walter. Especially if they didn't know you'd learned all about her earlier. Well, give us a chance, Governor. It's just a bit of luck. She was pleased enough anyway. Yeah, quite surprising, that, considering her loss the night you had the seance at Dr. Probert's. Loss? The vase that was stolen from her house. Oh, well, no one told me. Anyone tell you about the Etty? <laughs> What's an Etty? The picture that was taken from Dr. Probert's. Two of your clients. Oh, and you lot suspect me, do you? <laughs> Come on, look, I'm booked for three more seances at Dr. Probert's. Now, it's more than my career's worth pinching clients' property. Tell me, Mr. Brand, these things that happen in seances, spirit ends and so forth, do you actually believe in them yourself? Try to trap me, Copper. No, I ain't obtaining money by false pretenses, because I don't guarantee nothing. I can't. Not without the cooperation of the spirits. If things do happen which none of us can account for. Have you ever heard of objects being spirited away? Yes, quite often. We usually get the blighters in the end. Now, Constable Owen, to keep a close watch on that house over there, the one with the lace curtains. Number 92. Oh, yes, Sarge. When Miss Crush comes out, make sure she doesn't see you. Got me to follow her? Certainly not. I'm not interested in anybody leaving the house. I'm interested in anybody entering. I know where Miss Crush will be. She'll be communing with the spirits in the dark. Is there someone who wishes to get in touch? Are you prepared to answer questions? Three raps for yes, one for... Hi, Uncle Walter. We have two scientific gentlemen with us. Are you prepared to assist us in our experiments? Look. See it, Strathmore? It's a materialization. I never thought I should live to see anything so convincing. It's a common enough manifestation. Oh, it touched my cheek. Now it's tugging at my dress. Is it by Jove? I'm not having that. It's all right, it stopped. I'm not allowing my fiance to be interfered with. Uncle Walter could never resist a pretty girl. <laughs> I'm not prepared to tolerate a hand at liberty under the table doing unspeakable. Ow! I'm being pelted with fruit. The spirit thinks you're hostile, Captain Nye. Try to reassure it. Oh. Oh. <sighs> the spirit has left us. Dr. Probert, could someone switch on the electric light? Oh, Nye, you ruined everything. I've waited for 12 years. I'm not allowing my fiance's clothing to be 
Damn, missed my daughter the curls left. We had the eternal secret within our grasp and you ruined it. Except this is what you call a scientific experiment when young ladies are molested. But these things happen. I'll repair the small amount of damage our visitor has inflicted. Now, Dr. Probert, I see no reason why our second experiment cannot proceed. Now, for this next experiment, Mr. Brand has agreed to use a piece of equipment that I myself have devised. This house is one of the few in Richmond with the electric light. And uh, in my cellar, a storage battery is giving a total of somewhat over 400 volts. The light we are now enjoying is from that power. I sincerely believe that this evening we may find the answer to the last great unsolved question. Now, this is a resistor that will ensure that only a mild and even current passes along these wires uh, to the handles. When the handles are linked by a conducting agent, a circuit is formed. Yes, in this case, the conducting agent will be Mr. Brown. He will sit in the chair. But should he take his hands off the handles, even for so much as a fraction of a second, the circuit will be broken and experiment null and void. Now, here we have a galvanometer. And I suggest that Mr. Strathmore, Mr. Jarrett, undertake to record the exact flow of the current passing through the apparatus. And Mr. Jarrett, Mr. Brown has agreed that we can withdraw the screen from the fire. Yes, that, of course, is to provide us with enough light to make these records. Is it safe? Oh, it's perfectly safe, my dear. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, these are simply pieces of lint soaked in a saline solution to ensure a good contact. Thank you, Miss Crash. Now, Strathmore, observe the galvanometer closely. Electrical current is now passing through my body. It's registering 205. Now. Oh, it's most convincing. So, William, if you go down to the cellar, switch off the uh, light, leaving the current flowing to the chair. You're doing all this to make sure the fellow keeps his hands on the chair. Indeed. Seems to me it'd be a lot simpler if a couple of us stood behind the curtain watching him. Would it be simpler, William? But it would destroy the experiment. Mr. Brand is going to a state of total trance. For that, he needs complete physical isolation. We should be grateful that he's prepared to submit to the intrusion of the electrical wires, William. Well, what's the object of the experiment, then, for heaven's sake? The object is to produce in scientifically controlled conditions the ultimate proof of life hereafter. The total manifestation of a spirit. Yeah. <laughs> Fear a spirit presence. It's taking its time. I. Please don't be alarmed. My hand is stroking my hair. Oh, look here, yes. whatever you are. I know it means no harm. It just wants to come among us. There's a movement here, the current's dropping. It's steady now. 188. 10 23 p.m. 188. It's a spirit. It's a spirit talking. Current's up to 196. Should somebody look behind the curtain? I think we'll be justified. Is everything in order, Mr. Brown? Uh, it isn't. Well, what are you trying to do to me, for Christ's sake? Nobody. I was just going into my trance. Somebody comes creeping in there spying. William, take a candle to the cellar. Switch off the electricity to the chair. Dr. Probert, when an honest medium cannot trust his sitters... Mr. Brand, nobody left the room. Listen, I don't imagine these things. Your visitor was not of our world. It must have been a spirit visitor. Please, please. There were footsteps. As somebody came in through the door, they walked halfway across the room, and then they walked out again. You have just given a classic description of a haunting. That was a phantom. We all heard it. You think so? There's no other explanation. Ah. Oh. Well, uh, it's in that case. Switched off the electricity, eh? Would you be good enough to go and switch it on again? Only Mr. Brown has very generously agreed to continue with the experiment. Ten 
201. Something's there. Oh, the handle's turning. Nobody must move. It comes in peace. <gasps> Sergeant Crip, what the devil do you think you're doing? The galvanometer. The current's broken. Small wonder in this bear garden. When I asked you here, Jard, I didn't expect you to bring the rest of Great Scotland Yard with you. Neither candle Strathmore. I think we can safely assume that Mr. Brown will have nothing to do with our researches after this. William, switch off the current. Hurry, man, for God's sake. No, keep back. Don't touch him. Oh, what's happened? Uh, electric shock. Oh. Keep hold of her. This is doctor's work. Look after her, miss. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, I propose to take over the inquiry into these events, and I'm sure I shall enjoy your fullest cooperation. Now, Sergeant, what have you done with Quayle? He's in the gallery, sir, fastened to a loft chair with me darbies. I hope Dr. Probert has no objections. He's not liable to be troublesome, though. That's as neat a knockdown as I've seen, ma'am. Pure fright. I heard this noise like an army outside, and I struck the first man who burst in with notable British sermons. The book I was reading. Unfortunately, it was poor Professor Quayle. Yes, but I don't propose to concern myself with Quayle at this juncture. Mr. Brand said it's far more important, and Quayle's incursion was only a coincidence. Coincidence? What exactly are you implying, sir? I am asking myself if Quayle were not here as an accomplice of a fraudulent medium. He was not a fraudulent medium. <laughs> if we were to empty Brand's pockets and we found, say, a pair of white gloves or a handmade of plaster of Paris, then we'd know. Yes, yes, yes. That's exactly what I was going to suggest. Sergeant, will you please search the locket? Yes. What well, I can't begin to understand is how such an accident could have occurred. The resistor was a complete safeguard. Well, Sergeant. Box of matches, sir. Three half sovereigns, two shillings, seven pence. Keys on a ring. Wallet containing two stamps, railway ticket. No indication of fraud here, sir. I hope certain people feel suitably ashamed of themselves. One item you might not expect, sir. Hmm. On the back, sir. Four, six, nine, nine, two, eight, one. Hmm. Not significant. I would suggest a similar search of quail. Done, sir. He had a railway ticket, 12 shillings and seven pence, and a hip flask of gin. What I don't understand is what Professor Quail was doing in the house in the first place. Uh, Brown said somebody came into the study while he was in a trance. Could have been quail. You're a raw beginner. Took a piece of common royal Worcester when you could have taken a priceless Minton. Don't even know how to cut a canvas from a frame properly. You know, at first I suspected Brand. Well, that seems a perfectly reasonable assumption, a person of that class. His father was a common cabman, you know, and the boy was quite illiterate. Could scarcely even write his numbers. Suddenly admitted into well-to-do residences. I don't... Oh, my head, Sergeant. Exactly. Why should he queer his own pitch by robbing his clients? After all, he was on the way up just as you were on the way down. Wouldn't do you much good to expose him as a fraud, either. People would have started having doubts about mediums in general. Much better to scotch him by having him arrested as a thief. Then you get back all the clients he was taking from you. I shall deny it all. You have no proof. You see what's in the bottom of that glass? That little white object that's swelling nicely? You knocked a jar of it over when you broke into Dr. Probert's pantry. I found some of it in your top pocket. Pearl barley, Professor. Pearl barley. Oh, Lord help us. Still here, Constable? Well done. Eleven hours in the snow, Sarge. Nothing to report? <laughs> Not a thing. 
No, I thought not. The suspect's under arrest. I followed him myself. Didn't do what I expected after all. Yeah. I want you to go to Professor Quayle's house. Here's the key with the address. You'll find Dr. Probert's Etty in the umbrella stand. Miss Crush's vase will be in a cabinet in the bathroom. Then make an inventory of Brand's personal effects. Yeah, true. He's dead. It's an ugly business. Now, Inspector Jow wants a conference. I need some sleep before that. So do I. So report back to me here at 2 o'clock. Sharp, mind. Now, Dr. Benjamin, you carried out the post-mortem examination. Uh, the deceased, Brand, was electrocuted by a massive electric shock. Massive? Impossible. I checked the apparatus myself. Well, then, uh, you are wrong. I have subjected the circuit to a series of tests in my own laboratory. There's no fault in its construction. I shall tell the coroner so on oath. I have science on my side. And I have an electrocuted corpse on mine. Oh. Yes, well, I was present at the sounds. And as a senior police officer, I am a trained observer. And I saw a spirit hand. I have no doubt about it at all. A spirit hand that hovered and moved. And I submit. And, and, and I'm fully aware of the significance of what I am saying. We must look for a supernatural explanation of Brand's death. A hostile spirit. Poppycock. What? Brand was a charlatan. Have you never heard of Blue John? No. Not known to me. It's a substance, not a person. Calcium fluoride. When heated gently, it glows in the dark. Brand's hand was covered with it. The hand you saw was his. What is more, he was wearing a nightshirt, in a pocket of which was a small bag of talcum powder. You obviously have a closer acquaintance with the spirits than I, but I gather they manifest themselves with white faces and long, flowing garments. Well, we are... We are deeply in your debt. Oh, I can't claim much credit. It was only because we got this note to ask us to check for Blue John from uh, one of your chaps, the Sergeant uh, Cribb. I happen to notice, sir, when Dr. Prober was attempting to apply resuscitation, Mr. Brand's shirt appeared unusually loose, so I... Uh, I venture to request, um... Any other theory, Sergeant? No, sir. But permission to ask, sir. Assuming the chair was safe when this gentleman tested it... Yes, it was. Is there any way it could have been made lethal? By having the current bypass the resistor? Yes, by disconnecting it and fastening the mains cable directly to the chair. Oh, I certainly didn't have. Or by attaching something, say, uh, another wire, to the positive terminal on the main side and joining it to one of the wires leading to the chair. No, sir. So I presume, sir, you'll be treating this as a case of murder, sir? Now, you see, ma'am, if Bran was waving his right hand in the air to give the impression he was a spirit, it would mean whoever was on that side of him would have to have let go of that hand. The person on his right was you, wasn't he, ma'am? Yes. Now, I wonder if you'd be so kind as to look at this. It was on Bran's body. I won't bother you with the reverse side, ma'am. Just those numbers. 469-9281. Followed by a square. Does that mean anything to you? No. Yeah. You see, I think they were the most important things in Brand's life, those numbers. I've checked with the Hackney Carriage Licensing Department. 469 is the license number of a cabman called Charles Brand. But the other number, 9281, then a square. What do you think that means, Sergeant? Brand was an illiterate, ma'am. I think that was his way of writing an address. If you read it with his accent, you read it, Thackeray. Nine, two, eight, and... Then the square. Ninety-two, eight, and square. Your address, ma'am? I said you were a sensitive, Sergeant. You can look into a woman's eyes and bear the secrets of her life, can't you? It was a process of deduction. Seduction? Oh, no, it wasn't that. I was not so ill-bred as to allow myself to be seduced by a common cabman. I seduced him. I was one of the new women. In 1865, I heard a speech by Mr. John Stuart Mill on the emancipation of women, and it changed my life. I vowed then I would never be the slave of man. But I had to know what I was fighting against. 
So I resolved to make one foray into the enemy camp. I wanted to know the, the, the contents of his armory, so he could never take me by stealth. It was sound strategy. Very sound, ma'am. Obviously, I had to choose a man of suitable age and physical attributes, but, of course, quite outside my social circle. Well, I found such a man. Unfortunately, there was a consequence. Peter Brand? Yes. I provided money for his upkeep, but in the true emancipating spirit, I made quite sure it was his father who raised him. You lost touch with him? Oh, goodness, yes. It would have been most imprudent for me to have had anything to do with the boy. And one day last year, apparently his father told Peter the whole story. One can only assume he had drunk too much. It took Peter months to trace me. But he did. He seemed so charming at first. Of course, it was a terrible shock to me. But he seemed so interested in my life. And in the life hereafter. You do understand. I can see it in your eyes. I've no doubt, ma'am, that your interest in these matters is perfectly genuine. Thank you. Then why did you assist him in fraud? Oh, Sergeant, isn't it obvious? I had no choice. If I hadn't helped him in his deceptions, he would have told the world what had happened to a very rash disciple of Mr. John Stuart Mill. Brand never saw the chair before the night of the experiment? Certainly not. That would have invalidated the whole thing. It doesn't look as though he could have reached the resistor without leaving the chair. I should have thought that would have been immediately apparent to a cretin. When you finish crawling about, policeman, Flower petals. Ah, yes. Bowl of chrysanthemums was knocked over. You can relax now, Constable. I assume there's nothing else you want? If it's possible, sir, I'd just like to have a word with the other members of the family. Well, my daughter is clearly about to go out on a charitable mission. And ascertain if she can see you. It is only a gesture. I am sorry, ma'am, I didn't... They don't need the food. It would be much more sensible to keep the five shillings a week than to have a bottle of champagne on Saturday. Her real motives are her own affair. Possibly it is to escape for a few hours at least the constant surveillance of her fiancé. His concern for her safety must be extremely wearing. But in this family we are not in the habit of communicating with one another. Have you any questions for me? For the moment, ma'am, only to ask if it might be possible to reenact the events leading up to Brand's death. Probably Saturday night. My house is at your disposal, Sergeant. It will be no imposition. I shall not be there. Scissors, sharpen! On you for some time. Unlucky, weren't you? You'll find nothing in there to gratify your filthy tastes. It's the headquarters of the philanthropic ladies of Richmond. No, what? Just to teach you, you peeping Tom. She was as naked as the day she was born. Naked. Thank you, Constable. You've told me that twice already. Now show the lady's mother in. 
And remember what I told you, not a word about how you got your disfigurement. Sarge? No need to upset anybody unnecessarily. After all, she's probably never seen the inside of a police station before. Good morning, Mom. I'm glad you could come. Thackeray, help Mrs. Probert into a chair. You said in your note that I might be able to speak with... All Mother. arranged, Mom. Before I bring in the party who is held in custody in this building, I'd like to explain procedure. I charged Professor Quayle under the last act of 1861. He's also admitted two other offences, over Miss Crusher's vase and your husband's painting. But so far, I haven't charged him with these. It's not necessary to bring more than one charge at a time. Oh. Now, Miss Crush isn't anxious to press the charge. I'm sure my husband isn't either. He's rather antisocial about his paintings. Mind you, if I thought Professor Quayle was a danger to the public. He's a completely harmless man. He... He's no more wicked than you are, or your assistant. You might argue that he didn't carry any housebreaking tools with him. Nothing more incriminating than a bottle of gin. On the other hand, he did enter your house. Now, society takes a strong view about larceny. There's a minimum sentence of three years. Seven years maximum. Mind you, it's the company they keep in jail that breaks a sensitive man. That and the skilly they feed him. It's a great leveler, is skilly. However, if I could be persuaded that Professor Quayle entered your house for a reason that couldn't possibly be described as a felony, then I'd drop the charge. He came at my invitation to visit me in my room. It had occurred to me that might be the case, Mom. We had occasional evenings together. They were innocent of everything but the sharing of a small bottle of gin. I know you have every right to disbelieve me, as my husband unquestionably will. I can't imagine any way in which your husband would hear about it. Can you, Thackeray? No, Sergeant. So I think we might have the professor in. He's just next door. Winifred! Eustace! Mrs. Probert has explained why you entered her house, sir. You're free to leave the station. But I'd appreciate it if you both oblige me by clarifying one small point. Naturally, if we can. Your daughter, Miss Alice, ma'am. Whenever she set off with uh, a marrow under her arm, she said she was engaged in good works. Who was it who discovered what she was really doing? One of the servants saw her entering a house and reported it to me. And you mentioned it to Professor Quayle? After I had faced Alice with it, when I had discovered what the secret was. It was, after all, quite amusing. <laughs> For my husband's daughter to be embroiled in a woman's suffrage movement. Suffrage? And you, sir, mentioned it to Peter Brand as a joke. I must confess I did. <laughs> the idea of Dr. Probert, of all men, having a daughter who was campaigning for the rights of women. Campaigning you see, to... on the evening before the seance, Brand visited your husband. He'd followed Alice to that house. He'd seen her enter and emerge sometime later. The deduction he made was, if you'll forgive me, ma'am, that what your daughter was really doing was visiting a lover. A monster. By threatening to expose your daughter's supposed immorality, he secured Dr. Probert's cooperation in producing fraudulent effects, like throwing oranges around. Brand was a sharp mom, very clever sharp. And to think I tried to help him. What is more, he used the same threat to blackmail Alice that he would tell Captain Nye. That's why she said the spirits were stroking her hair and so forth. Well, I can only assume that you're right, Sergeant. After Bran's death, my husband finally brought the matter up, and she admitted that she had been going to these meetings regularly. My husband was deeply shocked at the idea of a woman having a mind of her own, but as her activities were clearly so much less questionable than he had supposed, he seemed prepared to take the matter no further. If we may go now? Of course, ma'am. I shall not be at your seance, but perhaps we may meet again on Saturday. When well, I propose to make the arrest. Crow. Oh. And I have a reading of 200 divisions. 200. That man behind the curtain is a sensitive. I know it. Oh! oh. The reading is the same. Two hundred divisions. The room is getting colder. Oh! It's that man Cribb on his way to purgatory! No, 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 no. Oh. Not so, Miss Crush. Now, that is enough of that, Sergeant. Oh, oh it's still a base command. It still isn't free. You can't oh. escape the force as easily as that, ma'am. 
Just a nightshirt and some talcum powder. Right now. Now, Captain, now, if you'll be good enough to go and turn on the electricity. Oh, oh my God. Oh, well. I will go and turn on the lights. This confounded thing is still reading 196. There must be someone else in the chair. No, miss. Now then, now, to explain. The handkerchief is conducting the electricity. The handkerchief isn't a conductor. A wet one is, sir. I mopped up the water with it. Yes, well, that was Brand's idea, not the sergeant's. Well, how could he put it there without breaking the circuit? May I demonstrate, sir? Well, very well, sir. Still reading 196. That's how Brand intended to produce a manifestation. That still doesn't explain how the poor beggar was killed. Quite right, sir. Now, if I may take the liberty of asking you to go downstairs to turn off the current of the just one more you, time. You are forgetting your position. Only as you understand how it all works. You do it. Thackeray! Have I seen you somewhere before? I don't think so, sir. Yes, now. Constable Thackeray will play the part of a corpse. Now, come along now. Come on. Left arm dangling, Constable. Thank you. There's no current. Now, you can all, all go to where we were. No need to switch the lights off. Ready, sir. You see? Brand needed the handkerchief for his own purpose. But in the near darkness, he saw it as a white object behind him. But as he reached down to pick it up... If it were touching that terminal, he'd die immediately. Uh, but are you really asking us to believe that it fell onto the terminal three feet behind the chair? It was placed there as a deliberate act. But that would have been murder. It was. But the handkerchief wasn't there when we found poor Mr. Brand. No, it wasn't. No. Then one of you... One of you must have picked it up. It's an engaging theory, Inspector, but you're not a shred of evidence. Nobody saw a handkerchief tied to the resistor. You can't even produce the confounded thing. Evidence, sir. I found these on the floor behind the chair. And what the devil are they? Chrysanthemum petals picked up on Brand's handkerchief when he mopped up the spilt water with it. The handkerchief was one item missing from Brand's possession. I don't suppose, Doctor, you notice these when you remove the handkerchief and put it in your pocket? Does a subordinate of yours have your permission to make this kind of accusation in my house, in front of my daughter and guests? Well, As I, I recall, I, sir, what? immediately after Brand's death, before the electric current to the chair had been switched off, you were standing by the door. That is correct. Captain Nye, sir, you were in the cellar, I believe. Mr. Strathmore, you were by the fire lighting a candle. Miss Crush had fainted somewhere about here. Miss Alice was looking after her. Would you mind, miss? Now, obviously, nobody could remove the handkerchief until the current was off. Similarly, when Mr. Strathmore brought in his candle, nobody could remove the handkerchief without being seen. It had to be taken in those few seconds when it was safe and also dark in the study. And the only person in the study apart from the deceased at that time, sir? Very well, policeman. If you want a full confession, you shall have it. But I prefer not to give it here in front of my family and friends. Before you do that, sir, I'd like to have a word with your daughter. Would you tell your father in your own words, miss, that you are not the murderer of Peter Brand? Are you being serious? Never more serious, miss. Your father believed that you arranged to murder Brand to silence him over certain matters. I know that you've since explained these events, but that was after Brand's death. When your father saw Brand and saw the handkerchief, he understood what had happened and assumed you had done it. Unless you can dissuade him, he's about to make a false confession to save you from the hangman's rope. Of course I didn't kill him. I only did what he asked me to do at the seances to protect you from any embarrassment. You do see how silly you're being, don't you, Papa? I'd better sit down. Well, somebody must have put the handkerchief there. Would you like to explain, sir? If you insist, sir. Now, it wasn't a premeditated crime. For Brand to have been electrocuted required a number of events nobody could have predicted. 
It required, for example, not only a handkerchief, but a wet handkerchief. Then if nobody came here wanting to kill Mr. Brown... Something happened that provoked it, yes, miss. Somebody believed until halfway through that evening that here at last was a true materialising medium. It was the betrayal of years of hope that provoked the murder. What betrayal? The sight of Brown sitting there with a the handkerchief stretched between the handles. Damn it, man, who are you saying did it? The first person to look through the curtains that evening. You're not denying it, are you, sir? If he'd been a genuine medium, he wouldn't have needed to touch the handkerchief. All I did was put him to the test. I wouldn't call that murder. Now, it's a question a court of law might argue over, sir. But it's my duty to charge you with murder. I'm sure of that. By the way, Sarge, the probers still don't seem to know the real reason why Alice visited that house. Better they never find out. Why, if you think of it, you probably imagined it. I don't imagine things, Sarge. Thackeray, I must tell you about an item of police equipment that you may not know you have. Sarge? It's your blind eye, Thackeray. And it's as important as your bullseye lamp or your truncheon. Well, something I noticed this evening, but I didn't report it to you. I was using my blind eye. Oh? When I was waiting outside the library, I saw Professor Quayle tiptoe into the study and come out again. He had a bottle of gin in his pocket, and he made his way up to Mrs. Probert's room. That wasn't necessary to the investigation. Well, instead of throwing her book of sermons at him, Mrs. Probert opened her door and pulled him in. I shouldn't think there'll be much of that gin left by now. I wouldn't lose any sleep over that, Thackeray. The last I saw of Dr. Probert, he was inviting Miss Crush to take a look at his Eddie. Well, Sarge, I hope she knows how to turn a blind eye. <laughs> <laughs>